And to other stories now, the European Parliament voted overwhelmingly today to waive the immunity for two lawmakers in the cash for influence corruption scandal. Now, by a show of hands, the Assembly backed proposals to lift the immunity of Italian Andrea Cozzolino and Belgian Marc Tarabella, both of the centre left socialists and Democrats. Tarabella himself also gave his assent in the chamber. Speaking after the vote, Mr. Tarabella told reporters he was innocent and would respond respond to questions by Belgian authorities. Greek member of the European Parliament, former member of the European Parliament, as well as two others, are in Belgian custody facing charges of corruption and money laundering in relation to alleged payments from Qatar and Morocco. To all the stories in its military bases, defense chiefs have said that amid mountain concern over China's increasing assertiveness in the disputed South China Sea and tensions over self ruled Taiwan, Washington could be given access to four more locations under the 2014 Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. Uh, the U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Philippines Defense Secretary Carlito Galvez said in a joint news conference. Austin, who is was in the Philippines for talks as Washington seeks to extend its security options in the country as part of efforts to deter any move by China against self-rule Taiwan, said he and his counterpart reaffirmed their commitment to bolstering their country's alliance. These efforts, which we hope to jointly undertake is in line with the guidance of President Ferdinand Marcos, and that is for the Defense Department to make sure that not an inch of our nation's territory will be lost, and our people's safety and security will be ensured by the strengthening our diplomatic relations with our allies, preserve peace, and create a stable international environment in the Asia-Pacific region. We discuss concrete actions to address destabilizing activities in the waters surrounding the Philippines, including the West Philippine Sea. And we remain committed to strengthening our mutual capacities to resist armed attack. I just want to be clear that you know, we're, not, we're not seeking permanent basing in the Philippines. As you heard us say in our statements here, uh, EDCA, EDCA is a cooperative agreement that uh, enables uh, rotational activities. And so it's a key pillar of uh, training and, and uh, opportunities for, uh, to strengthen our interoperability. Where, where the, uh, these guys, their sites are located. Please, uh, um, also we want to... I, I would simply say that, uh, you know, our goal is and always has been uh, to promote uh, greater security and stability throughout the, the region. Uh, we remain committed to uh, uh, our uh, extended deterrence uh, commitment, and we're very serious about that when it, when it comes to the, to the ROK. Uh, and we will continue to, uh, uh, to work alongside our, our allies and, and train and uh, ensure that uh, we maintain uh, credible and ready forces. China, on the other hand, has warned that the cooperation between the United States and the Philippines should not target any third party. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning says the U.S., which clings to zero-sum mentality, continues its military deployment in the region out of its own interest. It is aggravating regional tension, jeopardizing regional peace and stability. Countries in the region, she says, should stay alert and avoid being coerced by the United States. There have been developments from the suicide bomb attack at a mosque in the Pakistani city of Peshawar. A provincial police chief says the blast killed more than 100 people and the incident was filmed on CCTV entering the high security area on a motorbike. The bomber has been identified as a member of the militant network. The CCTV footage appears to show the bomber wearing a helmet and a mask riding his motorbike through the main checkpoint of police line parking his bike and asking for directions to the mosque before walking there. The police chief says the guards at the entrance thought he was a member of the force and they did not check him. The bombing has been described as the deadliest in a decade to hit the city of Peshawar. 
And let's head to the United States, where a new data shows that Afro-Americans were disproportionately killed by police in the United States last year, as the country registered more police killings in 2022 than any other year in the past decade. Collated by a non-profit um, organization mapping police violence, the data shows that a total of 1,192 people were killed by police in 2022, and Afro-Americans Americans were 26% of those killed by police, despite accounting for only 13% of the population. The data showed Afro-Americans were also more likely to be unarmed and less likely to be threatening someone when killed. The data collected over the past decades, 2013 to 2022, show that Afro-Americans were three times more likely to be killed uh, by police than white people and 1.3 times more likely to be unarmed than white white people when killed by police. The reports all speak to the fact that the overused violence in the United States and the deep-rooted racism have never stopped haunting the American people. Let's go over to Washington, D.C., where our correspondent, Maria Bird, joins me now. Hi, Maria. Um, Maria, I can only imagine the charged atmosphere. Uh, it is in Boulevard Christian Church, uh, Memphis, last night, uh, involving the funeral of uh, Mr. Nicole's. Um, there also was a call for justice. Um, tell us about, you know, the atmosphere in Memphis. Well, that atmosphere in Memphis, I think, was heart wrenching. Um, you know, what you hear from those who were just protesting on the streets, those who were outside of the church, and those who were in the church attending the service. Um, it's a scene that I think Americans uh, have seen way too many times before. Um, and obviously, it's one that is being called to uh, end and called for change to occur. So essentially, there wasn't any difference in terms of, you know, um, the, this call for justice and, you know, situations such as this that we've seen in the past that the U.S. has suffered from. Yes. Well, when you talk about a change, I mean, there has been, um, as we all know, there's been the George Floyd um, Act that has been brought forth before Congress. Uh, there have been all types of calls over the last three to four years about uh, reforming police. Um, but if you really look at historically, the U.S. has had challenges in this area um, ever since we look back to Jim Crow eras um, and we go back into the civil rights um, eras and we see uh, where policing against unarmed African-Americans um, has obviously been much higher uh, than other groups over the years. But now, uh, as we see social media, as we see the access to uh, video clips and just more sight into actually what happens um, on these crime scenes, uh, I think has just called for more action to be done. And it's showing that it's now time to have real change um, in America. The question though is, is Congress going to respond? Are local leaders going to respond? Or is it going to continue to be an outcry uh, from those Americans uh, who are protesting? And Maria, Vice President Kamala Harris said as time lawmakers passed the police reform bill, um, why would Congress be stalling on this? Well, Congress, um, you know, obviously we are just now getting into this next session. It took us quite a while to get a speaker. Um, we are dealing with a Republican-led House. Um, and so some of the priorities are not quite one of the George Floyd Act. If we just look at the reality of what's uh, before us, uh, we have issues around the right to bear arms. That has always been something that is brought forth when we try to do more restrictions around policing or restrictions around gun reform. Um, and so you have many individuals who still believe that the right to bear arms is a priority, despite what we're seeing with killing across the U.S. And specifically in this case, killings by police. And so the hope is that Congress will do more. We're hoping, obviously, that we'll begin to see where there will be a change, but it has to start with legislation. But some local districts are calling for police chiefs to make change within their own police departments, and that being the beginning uh, to what we see as change. So, Maria, we're going to come back to you shortly, but let's take a look at the report you sent in um, about police killings and Tyrone Nicole's funeral.
The killing of an unarmed American by police has become an all too familiar scene in the United States. Memphis man Tyree Nichols was buried on Wednesday after video clips were released of the brutal beating that led to his death. To be safe. So when we talk about public safety, let us understand what it means in its truest form. Tyree Nichols should have been safe. So I'll just close by saying this. I was, as a senator, as a United States senator, a co-author of the original George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And as vice president of the United States, we demand that Congress pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Joe Biden will sign it. And we should not delay and we will not be denied. It is non-negotiable. Many Americans are outraged by the number of police officers that were involved in the incident and are calling for a complete overhaul of the Memphis Police Department. That the stomach to go forward with this change has seemed to left those that are now comfortably nestled in Congress who are now saying fund the police and have forgotten about the promises that they have made to black people that put them in power. We've got to see some substantive change across this nation so that these types of incidents don't have us standing here time after time again singing from the same song sheet. As a mother with a 29 year old, That hits hard for me, and I'm trying so hard not to cry, but it hits hard because I have a 29-year-old, and to hear a 29-year-old call for his mama. It's not right. It's supposed to be a system that protects us, that provides safety for us, but instead it's killing us, murdering us, innocent lives who just began their adulthood. In the last 12 months, over 1,100 people have been shot and killed by police, and oftentimes the officers have experienced minimal consequences. This has called for American activists to call on the federal government to investigate those incidents as civil rights violations. From Washington, Maria Bird, Channel Television News. And Maria, thanks for that report. And, you know, with all of this happening, we also heard the recent report about the data showing that Afro-Americans were disproportionately killed by police uh, in the U.S. last year. What are the reactions to this latest report? I think it's something that's been known for quite some time. I think that whether or not people have seen the numbers or it's been anecdotal in nature just due to what we see reported on the news or what is seen in our own communities. And so uh, I think that where we are as a country is that Fortunately, I'm not sure if you all have heard about, but they call uh, the blue blood, which is police officers. And unfortunately, we've seen whether or not the officer is of Caucasian descent, white descent, or any other um, ethnic group, they are seeing African Americans and specifically unarmed African Americans as a threat. And so that has been ingrained in the culture of policing, and that is a culture that Americans are calling for things to happen. Now, how does that change happen? Many are, are believing we should start grassroots with that change, uh, because as you said, the numbers are showing that African Americans are 26% of the group, but only 13% of the population. This also goes to what we see in our jail systems. And so, uh, unfortunately, the U.S. is still very much tied to the tragedy of racism and the injustice of racial reality in America. Maria, thank you. And thanks for your reporting. Our Washington, D.C. correspondent Maria Bird live for us there. Thanks again. Meanwhile, experts say the death of Tyra Nicole serves as another tragic reminder of the deep-seated racial discrimination, aggressive police system in the United States. Mr. Nicole's death sparked widespread outrage across the U.S. And once the U.S. again has raised questions over the persistent problems of police brutality and systems of 
racism covering every aspect of U.S. society. The tragedy is the latest in a series of incidents which have shocked America and the world, with the death of the African-American man, George Floyd, May 2020, being a catalyst for widespread protests under the Black Lives Matter movement. The aggressive policing tactics, which have become the norm in many black communities, only serve to worsen the situation in many areas, creating greater public distrust, leaving crimes unsolved. Well, despite the major outcry over another avoidable death, many are fearful there will be a continued recurrence of such incidents as racial discrimination in the U.S., law enforcement agencies and across other parts of society, which they say cannot be changed overnight. Staying in Memphis, but away from the Nicole's funeral, a winter storm is bearing down the city, an important freight hump in Central America, disrupting local traffic, affecting people's daily life. The city is under an ice storm warning. The public transportation system has been shut down for two days and some public services, including schools, have been closed. At least 5,000 households and companies suffered from a power outage. Transportation Department has warned drivers to slow down on slick roads and launched an emergency plan for the extreme weather. Still ahead on the program. It's usually the other way around, but one police officer rescues his dog's best friend during a tornado in Texas. We'll have that story and more after this break. Welcome back. The U.S. State Department is concerned over the release this week of a Sudanese man facing the death penalty in connection with the killing of a U.S. diplomat in 2008. Abdul Abu Sayyid was found guilty along with others in the killing of American John Granville and a Sudanese colleague who both worked for the U.S. Agency for International Development and were killed by gunmen in Khartoum. Abu Zaid's brother disclosed that his sibling was released by the country country's high court based on a multi-million dollar 2020 settlement between Sudan and victims of attacks, including the one that killed Granville. State Department spokesman Ned Price said in a statement that the assertion that the United States had agreed to his release as part of the settlement was inaccurate. According to a Sudanese legal source related to the case, the money received by Granville's family um, says from the Sudanese government was interpreted by a majority of a court as a release of their right to retribution and the acceptance of blood money. Earlier, my colleague Anne Wilder spoke with an expert in international law about the situation. Imprisonment of uh, Abdel Rauf. You recall there were five. One uh, was at large. Four were convicted and they, they ran away from prison. There was a prison uh, escape. He was eventually rearrested. Uh, the other two are said to be dead. One is in Somalia. And uh, he's been in prison for the last 15 years. Now, looking at it from the international point of view, recall that there is an international convention for the suppression of, uh, finan of the financing of terrorism of uh, 2002. It was drafted in 1999, signed in year 2000 and became effective 10th January 2002. Sudan is a party to that, uh, that uh, treaty. And uh, by virtue of Article 26 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, there is a principle of Pacta Sousavanda, that is, agreements are meant to be kept. So it is expected that Sudan will be bound by the convention and uh, one of the effect of the, being a party to that convention is that it will not do anything that will show it as uh, taking actions to, that will be against that convention. Okay, but so talking about... So the situation where it will allow its legal system, ex except it is in black and white, the, the money paid to the U.S., $335 million in the year 2020 during the Trump administration, I don't think it is in black and white that the prisoner could be released. If it were so, they would have released him before now. But waiting till 2023 and releasing him, 
by way of implication, uh, I think the, 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 the released uh, convict will still be susceptible to the treatment of uh, international law. So he will have no place to hide except in Sudan. All right, but talking I, I, about I, I, the Sudanese all government, countries, Mr. Ive. Yeah, talking about the Sudanese government, yes. I mean, they say the U.S. government is aware and in agreement with that arrangement that got the killer released, but the U.S. government has denied this. What do you make of this development? I think uh, uh, the Sudanese government can show by uh, documents that uh, the U.S. actually mm -hmm. agreed, but, you know, the U.S. sadly collect blood money, and uh, the onus is on the Sudanese government to prove that uh, the U.S. government accepted that situation. And uh, if you read the, the news reports very well, the court read into the amount paid in 2020 as payment, as blood money that has been paid. And the mother of John Granville has, say, has said now that if she knew that the money paid to them would be related to the release of the... Away from that story, the International Committee of the Red Cross says the improved security in Ethiopia's Tigray region since a November ceasefire has allowed aid to reach some previously inaccessible areas. But however, humanitarian needs remain urgent as hospitals in the region struggle to deliver care to patients. The two-year war that broke out in Ethiopia in November 2020 between the federal government and forces led by the Tigray People's Liberation Front has created famine-like conditions for hundreds of thousands of people, killed tens of thousands, and displaced millions. The government and Tigray forces agreed to end hostilities in November, which has allowed additional aid to reach the region and for some services to be restored. However, the destruction of hospitals and looting of ambulances mean medical services are still lacking. There are lots of uh, needs, uh, particularly in the remote areas. And when you do not have phone, uh, phone service and you do not have ambulances and there are no medications, there is absolutely no way you can refer patients that you cannot even treat. Uh, when I was in Yechila, uh, I remember the healthcare staff there telling me that they've had patients who uh, really needed to be referred to, to hospitals like in, in Abi, uh, Adi, which is not very far from Yechila. But they cannot do it because... There is no ambulance service, there is no home service to call the hospital and say, look, uh, we have this case here that needs to. And sometimes uh, when they refer these patients, and they say, look, we, we don't have what it takes to treat you here. Uh, maybe we will consider sending you some, somewhere else. The patients just decide to go home because it's not possible. At the Yachila Primary Hospital, located in a part of central Tigray that saw intense fighting, the walls are riddled with bullets and supplies are short. You can see how much damage happened to our hospital. We've tried to make inventory of how much damage happened to our hospital. It is more than 90 million Ethiopian bear. They tried to damage and loot, so we are suffering with lack of supplies. So we are managing to give what we have in our hearts. But that's not enough, because seeing patients who come to be treated die in your hands is very painful. The ICRC says the Ethiopian Red Cross Society has not yet fully resumed services across the Grey because of a lack of supplies and the destruction of equipment. Out of 250 ambulances it operated in Tigray before the conflict, only 82 remain and many of those are not active. And we end with the story of love, friendship and perhaps sacrifice. We will take a look at this video, CCTV footage showing a canine officer dashing through a tornado to rescue his police dog in Texas. This was during the weather event that hit January 24. Officer Joe Nitchman from the Deer Park Police Department, at Southeast Texas, braved extreme weather conditions to save his partner Ronnie from a park police vehicle. Police said the National Weather Service issued the tornado warning for the Houston area on that day. A twister touched down in Pasadena, Texas, damaging homes, buildings and power lines. Thank goodness they're both safe. That's our program this evening. Thank you for watching. I'm Minnesota World.